As you may or may not know, this morning marks 10 years of gathering as a church. On Friday, we had a beautiful dinner down at the Women's Club and celebrated what God has done in our midst. Uh, in just a moment, I will paint with broad strokes the story of resurrection for those of you unfamiliar with it, but I want to spend most of our time this morning looking forward. For as we've approached 10 years, one conversation has stuck out, a conversation I had with our sending church's pastor about planting in downtown Charleston several months before our first public service. Seth Polk, uh, the lead pastor at Cross Lanes Baptist Church, heard my testimony, my vision, and my, my strategy for planting downtown. And before he agreed to mentor me on that journey and to support our church on that journey, he offered these words of caution. If you're going to plant in Charleston, in the city, it's going to be slower than you think, and you'll need to give it 10 years to really lay down roots. 10 years later, here we are. Now cue the broad strokes of the story for those who don't know it. On April 6, 2014, we held our first public worship service in the Planetarium, or Electric Sky Theater, as it was then branded, I don't know if it still is, in the Clay Center. Uh, we had a little over 20 charter members committed to this vision of seeing the spiritually dead rise to follow Christ. 160 people showed up to our first service, which was exciting, but uh, the air conditioner wasn't working, and it was almost 80 degrees in the dome. That should have been the sign of things to come as we sit here cold uh, the week after Easter. Launch Sunday is, of course, one thing, and starting a church with, with such a small core team is entirely another. The rest of 2014, in two words, we could say was exciting and chaotic. 2015, in two words, three words, four, four, four-ish words, tumultuous and profoundly challenging. In 2016, I heard about a church on the west side that was planted several years earlier that had done a lot of good ministry out of a facility that was slowly falling apart as the church itself had fallen on hard times. To make a long and convoluted story short, we agreed to take that building, renovate it, and multiply the sort of ministry it was designed to do and meet there as a church on Sunday mornings while we do it. I don't think I can articulate just how much of a labor of love that project was. We spent most of our money and hundreds of hours laying floors, tearing down and putting up walls, cleaning and painting. In 2017, we launched the Risen City Center in that space. And in April of that year, we held our first worship service there. Other things happened in 16, 17 that were less obvious to the public eye that were going on behind the scenes. We revisited and solidified our understanding of the church and our ministry philosophy. We developed our five distinctives, which you'll hear more about later in this sermon series. We voted to affirm our bylaws, as imperfect as they may be, and we slowly continued adding to our membership. After several months in the Risen City Center, a few things became apparent. Now, in my mind of like an ambitious church planter, our church of about 70 was quite small. But in the community, that is quite large. Something was imported that already existed, even though in my mind, it was still on the ground level. I began to wish that that space had a church that was more directly the fruit of the ministry in the space throughout the week. Well, in God's providence, my friend Michael Farmer was a member of our church who had been attending for some time, who had ministry aspirations and felt a desire to plant such a church one day. So I approached him with a crazy idea. Hey, I know that uh, our little church just spent like all our money and all our time renovating this building, but I have an idea. What if over the next few years, we just gave it all to you, uh, left a core team with you, and Resurrection found a long-term home somewhere downtown where we can be a center for gospel proclamation across our city and church planting across our state. I know it'll shrink us a bit in the short term, but this might do a few things. One, empower more local ministry that is explicitly gospel-centered on the west side. 
Second, it would help us multiply leaders in churches, thinking beyond just like our one church and having a vision of multiple healthy churches reaching the city. And third, it would provide some of the logistics that would become necessary as a church of 70 would go to 80 to 90 to 100 and so forth. He was excited about the idea, and I began to share it with the church, a church that, mind you, had spent to renovate that building $50,000 conservatively, who was bringing in about $6,000 a month. So do the math. You're looking at a budget of $100,000 per year, approximately, um, which is not a lot of money. Hey, good job on all that work you've done for the last year. I think we should move again for the sake of multiplication and mission clarity. We didn't know where and we didn't know when in 2017. Later that year, West Virginia State University posted this theater for sale. As soon as I saw it, I called Nick and we came to look at it. I became convinced that we needed to make a move on it. This is the sort of space we can grow with, we can improve, we can still leverage for our community. It has a parking garage next door, a lot that uh, for now we can use. To build such a space would cost all kinds of money. Now, I mentioned our budget a moment ago. and As you know, banks don't generally like high-risk loans. Uh, But by the grace of God, with the help of Cross Lanes Baptist Church, with the help of the West Virginia Convention of Southern Baptists, we were able to buy this facility for $280,000 in 2018. Moving in here required a lot of work once again. But we more quickly began to see some growth and some fruit. Our budget almost doubled in a year, and we moved from an average attendance in the mid-70s to the mid-90s, even though we left seven families, over 20 people, back to be part of Risen City's core team. And so I reminded our church in the early days, it seems like a little bit of growth, but if you factor in the fact that we left a third of our congregation, uh, it is quite the overhaul. Our church, however, has not been on an ever-increasing march to glory. The disappointments are too many to count. Our church was not exempt from the suffering and sifting of the COVID days. Who's in? Who's out? Who's new? Who's here to stay? In 2018, we had our very first service here in the theater. And for the next year or so, we began to see some real momentum. As the world changed, however, that momentum came to a screeching halt. I think a church planting team needs to leverage momentum without relying on momentum. Sometimes we need momentum from God. Other times God wants us to learn how to live without it. And even in these difficult days, God was with us and he was working. The next couple of years were not glamorous. Over the last couple of years, we've slowly relayed needed foundations. We have added to the core We have re-emphasized meaningful membership. We have settled into ongoing rhythms of discipleship, trying to hold forth this vision of a high commitment church because our Lord Jesus Christ calls us to such. And by God's grace against all odds and often despite us, God has planted this church in downtown Charleston. Over the next few weeks, I want to let the scriptures inform what it looks like now that we are, in a sense, planted. By God's grace, yes, the church is planted, but our goal is not to simply plant a church. For no farmer plants a seed and assumes their work is done. No, no, fruit is the glory of the seed. Our goal, now that we have this space, now that we have a stable and growing membership, we have a bigger budget, a viable church downtown, our goal is to be the gospel light that we prayed we might become. Until the kingdom of God has come, friends, we have not arrived. Our task is not complete. Remember, friends, the church herself is an outpost of the kingdom of God. It is a colony of heaven in a country of death. We are a people who together submit to Jesus, who live his way, who proclaim his kingship, and who advance his rule in the world around us. So having been planted, having considered the broad strokes of the story that lead us here this morning, 
What now? I want to make the case from Matthew 25 that we must faithfully steward all God has given us to advance God's plan for the world. We must faithfully steward all God has given us to advance God's plan for the world. Uh, Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we're just going to go from there. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and to each according to his ability. And then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful, faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. So let's not just helicopter right in without thinking about uh, what our text is teaching. Uh, it rises from a series of parables about how we should live in light of the end. In chapters 24 and 25, Jesus helps us think about how to wait for his return. Uh, most of this material is in the form of a parable, each parable building off of the other. A Christian vig vision of waiting emerges from the whole. We should stay awake we should be alert. We should be ready to wait for a long time. We should not let normalcy lull us into complacency for amid such normalcy, uh, the Lord will return. What does the parable of the talents then, the one that we just read, teach us about waiting? What does it contribute to this broader discussion in the 24th and 25th chapters about how to live in light of the end, how to wait for the coming of the king. I think it quite simply teaches us this, if we might just give you the point of the passage, that we must give ourselves to the master's business and the increase of his property while we wait for his return. Now, there are a couple of things that might be confusing if you're unfamiliar with uh, some of the language. First is the very term talents, the parable of the talents. Uh, the word is a translation in some ways, a transliteration of the Greek term talenton. We're not talking about like the parable of the talent or the parable of the skills. It's really like the parable of the money. A talenton would be uh, a reference to a specific amount of money. Uh, Don Carson, the evangelical scholar, argues that a talenton was the equivalent of about 20 years wages of a working man. So one talent equals 20 years of wages. And that's just if the unit of measurement is weighing silver. Uh, if it's weighing gold, then a talent is immeasurably more money than that. So uh, Carson prefers to call this parable the parable of the bags of gold. So we're not talking about like really skilled people, kind of skilled people, and then poor buddy, right? We're talking about a lot of money. We're talking about a very rich master. 
In the parable, this rich master has three servants. Now, servants in our context can denote some sort of voluntary servitude. Slaves is really what's in view here, that these people are slaves to the master. Uh, they don't, for whatever reason, they, they are uh, in his uh, service, and they, they don't really have a whole lot of say in the matter. And so he gives each of them different amounts of money based on his perception of how they will use it, how they'll invest it, what they'll do with it. He gives one of them five talents or about a hundred years of wages. So a lot of money. He gives another two talents, about 40 years of wages. He gives another one talent or about 20 years of wages. You get the picture. None of these are particularly small amounts of money. If we think about the story in terms of a guy who's got a lot of skills, someone who's got a few skills, someone who's got no skills, um, we can think about like a basketball player who can only dribble. You know, poor buddy, he can't pass, he can't shoot, he can't guard, he can't rebound, he can't cut, he can't really do anything. He can just, he can just dribble. Or you can think about like a poor dog who's got one trick. He can sit. You know, those dog people, they tell me that that's not even a trick. I mean, you tell that to my dog. You look him in the eyes and tell him that's not a trick. He worked really hard on that, Stephen. But supposedly it's not. And nonetheless, these three servants are given three different amounts of money based on the master's estimation of how they will handle it. Verse 16, he would receive the five talents, went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents went and made two talents more. So the guy that gets the five, the most money, goes and gets to work. The guy who gets the two goes and gets to work investing the money so that it might multiply. Now, I must confess to you this morning, I am not a money guy. I guess I like it. I know I wish I had more of it, but I'm not going to order my life around it or chase it or become like a finance bro or something like that. It's just not my vibe. I do know that it's easier to invest money with the aim of its increase in a world with stock markets and apps like Robinhood. I do have Robinhood, mind you. It's an app where you can buy some stocks. Money people think it's the dumbest thing ever, right? I mean, for instance, I bought, we bought a purple mattress a year or so ago, and I liked it, so I bought some stock in purple. And I would just tell you, don't buy stock in purple. Um, so, you know, I'm just not a money guy. It's easier, however, to turn a little bit of money into a little bit more money in a quick way in a global capitalist society. In the first century, it's a little bit more challenging to turn uh, a lot of money into a lot of money quite quickly. Like I said, I don't know a whole lot about uh, investing money, but as a pastor, I know something about laundering money. And so, um, that's a joke. I do know from, from movies, if you have to launder money, the more money you launder, the more elaborate your scheme has to be. You know, you've got to open some huge business and the more money, and they're always stressed out like, oh, that's too much money, we can't launder that much money, right? And so the, the, the number becomes a, um, an intimidating sum. And I think the same could be true with our, our characters in the story, that if you're gonna invest all of this money, all of this capital in a world where you can't just dump it into some giant company, you're gonna to have to hustle. You're gonna to have to work really hard. My guy is trying to turn 100 years of wages into 200 years of wages as quickly as he can. I mean, let's start leasing farmland. Let's start trading camels. Let's set up construction companies. Here, you need me to transport that from there? Let me do it. Pay me to do it. I mean, they're putting that money to work in all the ways they can. Both the five talent and the two talent guys do this, but not the guy who got one talent. Verse 18. But he who had received the one talent went out and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after some time, the master comes home and it's time to settle up. Verse 20. He who received the five talents came forward, bringing five more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made you five more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I've made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter 
into the joy of your master. Now, notice, these guys are proud of what they've done, and they should be. Work and productivity are good things. God cares about your day job. He cares about the stuff of normal life. Master, you gave me five talents. Here's 10. Master, you gave me two talents. Here's four. They're proud of the work they've accomplished. They've worked hard. It wasn't given to them. It was not easy. They had to take what they'd been entrusted with, figure it out, make something happen, and then they come to the master with what they have from what they were given, saying, we did our best, here you go. You gave us some, here's even more. And hear how the master responds in two ways that are surprising if we really analyze the parable. The first surprising thing is he says, you've been faithful over a little. Now remember, we're talking about hundreds of years of wages. If indeed this is a little, then we're dealing with a master of incalculable wealth. Let's else step outside the world of the parable for just a moment and remember that thing we've been preaching about for the last four weeks in 1 Corinthians 15 and then on Easter Sunday, the land of resurrection. Our master has a vision for the resurrection. The resurrection is something so much greater than we could ever imagine, right? I think it'll be a land of work and productivity and meaning that the, the, the work that we've accomplished in some sense will be, have ramifications 10,000 fold in the next. We have only just begun to see the wealth of our master. The second is this. The master in the story tells slaves to enter into the joy of the master. To in, uh, enter into the joy of... Uh, slaves don't do that. You know, thanks for the money, good job, now go make dinner, is what might be expected. But that's not the sort of reception this master gives his faithful servant. He is invited into the joy of the master. So the reward of produ productive work during the master's time away is not just greater dominion in whatever comes next, though it is that, but it is also a sharing of the master's joy. The faithful servant is given greater dominion and is allowed to share in the joy of the master. The servant Sounds more like a son. Well, time has now come for the man who received one talent to settle up, so he gets his shovel, and he goes out into the field, and he digs up what he had, and he brings his one talent back to the master. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, he says, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what's yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you should have invested my money with the bankers. In my coming, I should have received what was mine with interest at least. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the 10. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has, will be taken away and cast this worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, the final servant um, takes what he was given. Uh, he doesn't invest it even in a low-risk way. He doesn't try to multiply it. He doesn't try to grow it. He just hides it. And he's, it seems, motivated by uh, maybe a lack of knowledge of his master or his own laziness. Let's consider both options. He says, I, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and get gathering where you didn't scatter seed. In other words, you're not fair. You're not just. I have no desire to work for you. So he either thinks his master is a harsh man, a, a bad man, an evil man, or he's just lazy. And he, he's using this accusation as a front. I didn't go and do it because you're not... Great, you know, he's, he's got sort of um, a, a defensive response. I'm not going to do that. You're not a great guy anyways, whatever. And I got to be honest, when you hear this story, 
Uh, in our day, just kind of if you're reading through it, you might have an immediate thought like I have had over my life. Uh, is he really wicked and lazy? Is he really wicked and lazy? Because it sounds like something I might do. Because I'm not a money guy. Is he not just playing it safe? I mean, it's not uncommon in a world of antiquity to hide something in the ground that you wanted to make sure no one else found. And if he's not good at or maybe able to multiply the money, he seems to have taken the option that has minimal risk. He doesn't want to lose it. So he goes as other people would and buries it. Is he wicked and lazy or is he uh, frugal and safe? I think there's something for us to learn here about the relationship between courage and obedience. In one sense, if we're just thinking on a surface level, it, it, it is hard to blame the slave too much. After all, what difference does it make to him? It's not his money. He gets no commission on it. What if he multiplies it somehow? Well, it, 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 then it just goes to the master. What if he invests it and then loses it, makes some bad decisions and loses it all? Well, then, then he's in a world of hurt because he squandered the master's money away. But, but here is the fundamental problem. Here's why he's met with a rebuke instead of a, all right, wish you got more, but whatever, man. He did not understand who his master was, and he did not understand who he was. Because he doesn't rightly understand his master, he is not motivated to work for his increase. As I said a moment ago with his little speech, he's either making excuses as to why he did nothing, or he reveals that his inaction is linked with his perceived harshness of the master. If, however, he understood the goodness of his master, then perhaps he would be more compelled to work for his increase. He would be more emboldened to take healthy risks. The wicked servant's estimation of his master does not line up with what we see in the passage. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. This is not the character of a harsh man. He does not understand his master, maybe, sure, but he has definitely forgotten that he's a servant. His job, okay, in the parable, in the story that Jesus is telling, his job is really simple, and all the hearers would know it. His job is to improve his master's assets. His job is to improve his master's assets. That's what a servant is supposed to do. That's why he was given the money in the first place. And the master says to him, it would not have been difficult to at least put it in a bank so that something could come from what I have given you. The servant in this parable neglected the fact that he was overseeing resources that did not belong to him. He was supposed to take what he was given, no more and no less, and work hard to increase it for his master's estate. There is much for us here as individuals and as a church waiting for the return of the Lord. Let's not lose the plot the church gathers until the day she is gathered by the Lord Jesus Christ. For the scriptures teach that we are bondservants to the Lord Jesus Christ. While we wait for the master's return, we are to multiply his assets. I want to make the case from Matthew 25 that we must faithfully steward all God has given us to advance God's plan for the world. Two things for us as a church this morning in light of this parable. First, we are stewards of God's resources called to pursue his agenda. We are stewards of God's resources called to pursue his agenda. I, I wanna make clear, friend, 
Everything you have, everything I have, everything we have is a stewardship from God. Oh, no, you, I, I worked really hard for my money. Oh, you worked hard for your money. Like, good luck doing that without a brain. Good luck doing it without breath. Like, God has gifted you. God has gifted you according to his estimation of your ability. Remember, though, he's also the one who gave you your abilities. He has given you the resources for a task he has perfectly designed you to do. He does not demand from us what he's not given to us. He doesn't give you five talents and expect the return of one he's given ten talents. He simply calls you to be faithful to that which he's given you. So as a Christian then, in light of this, the the question that that we must ask, that, that I must ask, that you must ask, and not just ask one time, but continually ask, is not how much of my time or my energy do I give to God? But more fundamentally, the question is this. How do I live in light of the reality that all of my life is a stewardship and gift from God? So instead of how much do I have to give, our posture is, okay, what now that I am all yours? Like, we need to correct some things that like, can seep into modern churchianity America. Like, we don't obey God so that he'll just become a part of our life. No, no, no. Like, to obey God means to align our lives to his will. I'm not just being pedantic. Like, it's not so much this. Here's my plan, God. I want to have um, a spouse, two and a half kids, a well-trained dog, a, uh, you know, a big house, a meaningful career, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what I'm going to need from you, God, is I'm going to need you to bring that spouse into the story. What I'm going to need from you, God, is you're going to have to provide them kids, all right? God, I need you to give me money so I can get that house, because if I don't get it, then I don't get my vision. And so what we do is we go along, and as long as these things are happening, we think God's giving them to us. Everything is good. God is so good, but then suffering comes. The story doesn't continue this march of progress, suffering gets in the way. Loss happens. Our expectations are unmet. Here's my plan, God, fit it when you will, works to build churches for seasons, but not for a life of faith. It's more so this, God, show me your plan for the world and help me align everything I have to it. Honestly, you can make the case, and I'm gonna make it right now, that this is what repentance looks like. Repentance means changing your mind about sin. Sin is disobedience to God, walking by in the flesh. So in other words, to cease to walk by sin is to not walk in the flesh for our own desires, but to walk in the spirit for the glory of God. So repentance might be another word for discipleship. This call then to say, God, show me what your plan for the world is and help me align to it. That is not the call for a select few super Christians. That's the call for all of us. For I have a new master. My master was sin. Jesus teaches that that all who practice sin, all who sin, are enslaved to it. But Jesus frees us from the curse, the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin, and he raises us to walk in holiness, righteousness, and love. So then, my master was sin, and now it's Christ. Just like I obeyed myself, I obeyed my own desires, now I obey Jesus. Friends, I'm not, you're not, we are not responsible for what God gives us. We are, however, responsible for what we do with it. That's true individually, and that's true for us as a church. All that he's given you and all that he's given our church is to be invested and used for the increase of his kingdom in our city, our state, and among the nations. Which leads to the second thing I want to say from this parable and the final thing. That part was a little more for you individually, right? Although it has implications for us church-wide. This part is definitely for us as a whole, and you play a role in that. We have been faithful with one talent. (laughs) Will we be faithful with two? 
We have been faithful with one talent. Will we be faithful with two? I cried a lot um, on Friday night at the uh, celebration dinner, and I really uh, did not expect to, did not plan to. Just the weight of the moment hit me that my whole adult life has been uh, invested in planting this church. And so many of like the good days and bad days and the wins and the losses like, are just directly tied to what happens here. Like, I've experienced a thousand joys and 10,000 disappointments. And uh, all of those, the joys, but, but definitely the disappointments, have shaped me. Um, and and they've, they've also shaped our church. And so I'm looking back this week, something I don't like to do, because honestly, like, it's fun to celebrate 10 years, but, but for me, it's, it's actually quite heavy. Um, it's not just easy, because you don't just have good memories. You have bad memories. You don't just remember things that go well. You think of things that didn't go well. You don't just remember the things that you succeeded in, but, but more acutely, you remember the things that you didn't. And like in coaching, you, know, you hear like coaches talk about like, I don't really remember the wins, but I remember the losses. You know, that there's something about us that, that, that goes back to those places. And so I don't often look back in some of these days. And I opened some files that I hadn't opened in 10 years. And I was just reading some notes um, written by a 20-year-old, mind you. Uh, a whole other sermon. I saw a note about reaching $1,000 in our bank accounts and just being blown away by it, being shocked to see that God would entrust us with $1,000. And I, I want to make the case standing before you this morning that, that it's easier to take risks with $1,000 than it is $200,000. It's easier to invest one lifetime of wages and make money off of it than it is to invest five lifetimes of wages and make money off of it. God is the one who gives us what we have. God entrusts us with resources he calls us to steward. He has moved us from one with one tiny talent to a moderately sized talent. Friends, we're not a, a mega church. And we're not what I call a mini mega church, which is sort of like trying to be a mega church, but you do it in a really small way and it's just uh, awkward for everyone involved. Uh, we are not, however, where we were two years ago let alone 10 years ago. God has given us more gifts. He's entrusted us with more resources, more people, with more capabilities, more property, more uh, influence, more money, a better street. This building would not be $280,000 today. It would be much, much higher. The question before us now is whether or not we will continue to press forward for the advance of our master's kingdom or if we'll bunker down and hold on to dear life for that which God has given us. Will we take what we've given and say, God, thank you for planting the church. Now we're going to protect it because heaven forbid we lose it. Or will we take it and say, God, thank you for giving us this church. It's a proof of concept. We did this when we were kids. Now that we have some adults and money, maybe we could take this branding and make it more sleek. Maybe we could do this and do it a little better. Maybe we could start to trust in our own strategies, our own plans, our own innovations, and we can start to craft a church not in the image of God, but in our own image. We can stop saying, what does the Bible teach about the church? How has the Christian tradition understood what it means to be the church? And we can start asking, what's it going to take to really mix things up? In other words, we can take the church and hide it out of fear of losing, or we can take the church and run with it as an idol. But how can we take the church and invest it in the kingdom of God for the glory of God? Here's the question for us this morning. Will we remember the goodness of our master and move forward by faith. If we've been faithful to get here, to see a church planted in downtown Charleston, how will we now be faithful to give together all we have to see the kingdom of God grow in our midst? Uh, Ryan, I'm finished if you want to come on up. As faithful servants, uh, Will we give ourselves to the master's increase while he tarries? I just want to make the case this morning. Ten years, thousands of victories, thousands of failures, thousands of great days, thousands of bad ones. Hundreds probably, but, you know, we're exaggerating a little this morning. 
Will we take all of that and hold on to it, shelter it, try to be afraid of it, protect it, get dominative over it? Or will we, instead of falling in church with love with the church that was, will we fall in love with the church that will be? And we just hate everything about our past. We're never satisfied. We're never content. We always want more people, more this, better this, better that. And we're obsessed with the church that will be. No, no, no. Let's not obsess over the church that was. Let's not obsess over the church that will be. Let's obsess together over the Lord Jesus Christ and be the church together that he calls us to be right now. For we do not live, work, and play in an idyllic church. We do not live, work, and play in a perfect world. Our relationships, even as we sit right now, are marked by the stain of sin and disappointment. In all of our lives, we are where we thought we'd be, and we're nowhere near where we thought we'd be. So how do we live in the midst of this? How do we live between the church that God will build and the church that God has been planting? I just want to make the case this morning that the days of simple faith, healthy risk, and Christ-centered courage are not behind us. Those days of faith, of risk, and of courage are ever before us for we must be obedient to our master we used to talk about in the very early days people being in right so we would invite friends to like our little bible study we would invite friends to uh, our services when we launched them and we would ask you think they're in you think they're in so and so came you think they're in no I don't think they're in but got a lot of those So I ask you this morning, are you in? For I would contend that these are but the early days. The days of risk and courage and faith are not artifacts of a church planting story, but they are the realities of a planted church. We must take the next step in obedience, individually and together for the glory of our master and for the increase of his estate. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or think or imagine according to the power that works mightily within us. To him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ forever and ever throughout all generations. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. Um, as servants who have been entrusted with resources for a short time. We know that you will return. We know that you will not tarry for long. We don't know when you'll be back. We don't know how even though we may debate. We don't really know how you're going to come back. But we know that you will. Remind us of that reality. Remind us that everything we have is not ours, individually and corporately. That we are servants and stewards called to be about your agenda, the increase of your estate. So right now, God, will you add to this team? Will you add to this family of missionary servants? Will you call people together to sacrifice, to love, to move forward in faith and hope, to serve a broken and hurting world, to care for the lost and the downtrodden and the oppressed among us, to go to the nations with the hope of the gospel. Will you show us, God, in these years to come how to take a couple of talents and turn it into a couple more? Help us, Lord, be faithful. 
Give us focus this morning. Get us together like a huddle, Lord. Just remind us that what we're doing and why we're doing it. For your increase, God, may we devote ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen.